I work for the McClellan practice of Harley Street, which employs some of the top public speakers to schools. And I'm here with my colleague, Emma, who schooled me, mentored me when I was starting out. Emma was doing over a hundred talks a year across the country and Europe, and maybe even further afield probably. Um, and she's really helped my career come along. Now, Emma did a TED talk when was that TED Talk? Uh, May of this year. And I went to watch it and I was teary-eyed coming out of that. And I've brought him for the podcast here today. We're going to talk about her story. So how did you end up getting this story and speaking to schools? What, what, how did it all begin? Oh, 19th of April 1991 it began. Yeah. Which was the night I'd gone to a concert in central London spotted Ian in the crowd, Yeah. got chatting to him. We swapped numbers, didn't really think he'd call. Um, I was right getting ready to do my finals. So I, I really didn't have the space or the time to think of dating properly. Yeah. But he called and we went on a couple of dates, then put him on hold while I did the exams. So what were you studying at this point in time? I was doing a social and environmental studies degree. Okay. And uh, it was one of those, I didn't really have a career in mind. So I thought do a bit of everything. Yeah. And then maybe get some better idea as I sort of graduate. And you were quite an academic person. You wasn't a uni party person. Really. Oh God, no, no. I was very square and boring. You know, yeah. I'd grown up in a very rural part of England, pretty conservative family, didn't drink, didn't smoke. Yeah. You know, it was quite an eye opener going to uni even. Yeah. So... Yeah, I was I was quite boring back then. <laughs> um, in fact, I think it was probably my third year before I went to the student bar. You know, that's how <laughs> that's how square I was. But um, you know, it was the it was the mid eighty late eighties when I was studying. So we'd we'd had the safer sex message. So when yeah. Ian and I, after a few months of dating, thought about taking it to the next level, my biggest concern was getting pregnant. Yeah. So I'm going okay. Well, not on the pill. Don't want a baby going to have to use condoms yeah. because that's really all I'd picked up, the safer sex message, use a condom. Mm -hmm. And then there was that awkward negotiation of, you know, safer mm -hmm. sex, which again, no one teaches you. Yeah. It was just a case of blurt it out and hope for the best. And fortunately for me, Ian just, yeah, no big deal. Obviously, I'm going to take responsibility. And I just thought result. Yeah. Good looking, intelligent, responsible. Could this guy be any better? Um, and we chose together. We were ready to have a sexual relationship. And one occasion, the condom broke. Mm -hmm. Thought nothing of it, as you do. Just thought, well, it's just one of those things. Get the morning after pill. Yeah. And then 10 minutes later, he drops the bombshell. Not caring about getting me pregnant, but worried because he was HIV positive. Oh, my God. Um, how did he phrase that to you then? Well, he just did. He just said, I don't care about getting you pregnant. I'm worried because I'm HIV positive. Now... For me, growing up in the 80s, HIV was gay men and injecting drug users problem and haemophiliacs. I remember the news headlines, the gay plague, and yeah. people were saying like they deserved it. All these religious people saying the gays deserve it and drug users deserve oh, it. Oh, so yeah, really... some of the headlines from, from back in the day are just horrific if you look at them now. Um, so, so my idea and my image of someone with HIV was not a fit, good-looking guy from posh part of London. Yeah. You know, it did not fit. And When he said that to you then... What was the first thing that went through your mind? I think the first thing was, you can't be, you look normal. So you didn't think he had it because of the way he looked? Yeah. And then did you understand that there might be a risk to you? Not immediately, no. Okay. It wasn't until I rang a helpline the next day, because my biggest concern was all I knew about HIV was people got sick and died. Yeah. So I'm thinking, oh my God, my boyfriend's going to die. Yeah. So that was what I needed reassurance on. Didn't even consider that it would be a problem for me. So you were upset because you thought he was going to yeah. die. You had no idea. Didn't the risk. even think, you yeah. know, white heterosexual young woman. Yeah. We were we were not on anyone's radar as a risk group. Yeah. So I didn't even give it a second thought. And even when I was told there was a very small risk, I thought nothing of it. And even how did you find out there was a very small risk? Because I rang a helpline. Yeah. And what did they, they say? Well, they just said, well, if you've come in contact with your boyfriend, semen, that has the potential to transmit HIV. Yeah. So there's this very small risk. Yeah. But that's how they phrased it. And I just thought, well, it's, you know, if there's a small risk, mm -hmm. really, do I have to worry? No, probably not. 
Okay. And, you know, they did say, if you want to take a test, you can, but that's more for peace of mind, not because we think there might be a, you know, yeah. positive result. So when I went three months later to get tested... It took three months to get a test. Well, it did only because that was the time scale then back then for the test they used. Okay. You had to wait the 12 weeks because that's the time in which the body would have produced the antibodies that the see. test would look okay. for. Um, I think today you can probably get an accurate result within six to eight weeks. Right. But there's still a period you have to wait known as the window period. So during this wait for the test, you're thinking this is a tiny probability. So you're still concerned just about your boyfriend. Yeah, I, I I hadn't really given it any thought, and yeah. I probably looking back, if it, if I'd really considered it, might have been a positive result. I probably wouldn't have gone. Yeah. I'd have probably had you know been better off having blissful ignorance. Right. But I went thinking, well, there's no no problem. Yeah. Um, and prior to meeting Ian, I'd been a blood donor, so I knew mm. for certain that I couldn't have been infected at any other point in my life. Yeah. So I was going with the knowledge that there was only this one risk factor. No yeah. other time did we have unprotected sex. We use condoms every time. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a case of this really would be the million to one chance. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. And then when you actually went for the test, how long was it before the test results came in? Well, I was fortunate. I was obviously still living in central London and there was a same day testing service at um, Bart's Hospital in the city. Yeah. So I, I literally went in at nine o'clock, gave a sample of blood and was back at five o'clock for the results. OK. So, and when you got the result, then what went through your mind? Well, I think I, I can't remember for certain, but I'm pretty sure my first words were, no, you've made a mistake. Yeah. You've obviously muddled up my sample of blood with someone else yeah. because I still did not believe at that point that people like me got HIV. Yeah. I really didn't. And and then, of course, Would you they, say that you were in shock? Yes. OK. Yeah. And also they told me to wait 12 weeks and I'd gone on week 11. Yeah. So I kind of clutched at straws thinking, well, maybe that's why it's wrong. OK. And then he sort of said, no, look, it's your sample of blood. We found the antibodies that shows you have been infected. Yeah. You are now HIV positive. You're going to remain HIV positive for the rest of your life. And did you accept that or did you demand another test? Oh, no, I accepted it because I didn't, you know, mm. they, they'd done the job properly. There was no, you know, no doubt in their mind. So with the media just being up in arms over that at that moment, d did you then get terrified for your own life as well as being terrified for your boyfriend's life? Yes, I, th I think, you know, at that time it was very much HIV equals AIDS equals death. That yeah. was the kind of, yeah. you know, the progression. There was no thought of living then with HIV. Right. And yes, I went straight into support groups, but support groups where people were getting sick and dying. Right. So within only a matter of a couple of months of being diagnosed, I was going to funerals of oh people from God. support groups. Wow. So it was very bleak. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there really wasn't much hope back then. Yeah. Did you have support from family and stuff, or how did they react? Well, I didn't tell family straight away. Okay. Um, you know, I'm li I was living alone in London. I, I did have a cousin here who I think was probably the first family member I told. Yeah. Because I'd been staying at his place. Yeah. And, and he was obviously very shocked, but very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, and it was some months later that I chose to tell my family. Yeah. Um, Mixed reactions. Mixed reactions. Yeah. Um, Had um, any of them fed into the media hysteria then? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, again, we, we'd grown up in a very rural part of England where, you know, I didn't, you know, this is how closeted we were. I didn't know any black people till I went to uni. Right. I'd managed to go like 18 years of my life without mm. seeing a black person. Yes. I mean, you think it's ridiculous now, yeah. but that's how it was growing up where I was. Wow. So, yeah, I would say my family was very conservative um, with probably small rural attitudes. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of my family setup, my dad had died when I was a kid, so dad not dealing with it. Um, but I have mum and two sisters, mm -hmm. and I did tell my twin first because I figured people always say twins have a closeness. Yeah. Um, my recollection of how I told her is different to hers. So I actually thought we sat down with a cup of tea at her flat 
And she later told me, no, you blurted it out in the supermarket. Oh, my goodness. So I, I just don't remember. And in hindsight, that's terrible, but that's her recollection. So yeah. I must have done it that way. But we're talking like 27 years ago now. Right. So it's hard to remember the exact details. Um, unfortunately, with my mother, it became clear that a face-to-face -face conversation wasn't going to be a mm. right move. And I ended up writing her a letter, which she pretty much freaked out at. Mm. And um, it's fair to say that that wasn't the best reaction I had. Do you feel comfortable saying what was in that letter? Oh, I just told her what had happened. Okay. Um, but her reaction was... A, to not believe that I'd got it from one relationship, oh. assumed I'd slept around at college, oh. told me I should never have bothered graduating if I was going to be dead in a few months. Oh, my God. And I was never to have sex again in case I got pregnant and infected an innocent baby. <sighs> I can't believe I'm hearing this. I'm sure there mind. was a lot more, but that's the three things that really stick in my mind. Yeah. Um, and, you know, our relationship really didn't ever go back to what it was after she found out right um and actually to this day I've, I've had no contact with her now for 17 years so um yeah so you're you've basically now because of the media this thing is a death sentence your boyfriend's got a death sentence to you a sentence to death you've got these reactions from the family members uh, compounding you're suffering from some of them what is your boyfriend's health situation at this point in time well i thought he was doing okay yeah um but actually it, again it's hindsight now but what it became clear was that his immune system was starting to fail mm. um we are talking early 90s when there really wasn't the treatments we have today there yeah. wasn't there was just one or two drugs at best yeah and unfortunately ian was very much someone who was in denial about being infected really yeah so he wouldn't go for health checkups wouldn't take meds and ultimately the virus got into his brain type of dementia kicked in and well within within two years of my diagnosis he was dead so um yeah. so you basically were taking care of him until he died then well oh. the last few, six months of his life he was in hospice care so yeah. it wasn't me doing the caring but i was visiting most nights after work just because he was someone i'd loved and i wasn't going to let him go through that on his own he this... didn't have family um around so uh... it sounds like to me um you're such a selfless person because i think a lot of people watching this perhaps and myself even may have had a, a different reaction if someone if i slept with someone and um they had that and i didn't know it and they hadn't told me i probably be having feelings of even though i love the person i probably be having feelings of anger and what you know why have you put me in this situation why didn't you tell me um did, did was there a period that you started to I used to say no I had never had an anger phase but but there clearly was some anger yeah. but I hold on to the fact this was not a deliberate act yeah he, the safer sex message in the late 80s early 90s was use a condom yeah he used a condom every time right one broke that's an accident yeah it had huge consequences but nonetheless it was and always will be an accident yeah. now clearly you know I would can look at it now and go well I wish he'd told me and what would I have done? I'd have run a mile down the street to get away. Right. Because my knowledge of HIV then was very limited to what I'd seen on TV. Yeah. So his fear of rejection would have been validated. Yeah. Because that's exactly what he'd have got. So I understand why he didn't say anything. But when it's, you know, today it's a very different ball grain. Today you can have unprotected sex as a person with HIV and you know you can't infect your partner if you're taking treatment. So we, we've what done such... How does that work? <laughs> I know, it's, it's a huge leap forward. <laughs> but the science now shows that if someone who's HIV positive taking antiretroviral drugs, yeah. something called the viral load gets reduced to undetectable levels. Yeah. So if you're HIV positive, undetectable on your treatment, you can no longer transmit the virus. Wow, I no, have no risk. idea. Zero risk. Yeah. So I can have unprotected sex. I am not going to infect another person. Okay. That's how far we've come. Yeah. But 27 years ago, it was a very different ball game. Well, let's go back to then. So how did you manage to save your own life then? 
I think several factors came into play. A, I chose not to take AZT, which was the very first drug available. I remember hearing about that on the news. Yeah, AZT did, you know, do what it said, but it's a huge cost in terms of side effects. Right. And obviously at that time, late 80s, well, early 80s, it was developed. Very few women were in drug trials, if any. So yeah. I knew that drug had not had enough experience in females. So yeah. I was not going to touch it with a barge pole. Okay. I'd also seen people through support groups go onto it, get very sick and die. Mm. So in my head, I was like, this is poison. Yeah. You know, I'm sure it gave some people a few more years. But for me, I just saw the negative sides. Stop the chemotherapy. So I, I chose not to take the early treatments, which I think played a part. Okay. Second thing is rather than go on benefits, which a lot of people were pushed into, mm -hmm. I got a job. Yeah. I gave myself something else to focus on. Yeah. So within six months of being diagnosed, I'd taken, well, I'd been doing some voluntary work within a couple of months of being diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And then I got a paid job in local government and I yeah. stayed working for that first decade. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, yeah, I think probably contributed to why I kept going. And the, the doctors told you you've got so many years to live or anything like that? Yeah, the original prognosis was eight to 10 years. So part of me thought, well, if I'm going to die within eight to 10 years, I'll at least, you know, mm. do something with my life. So I just yeah. thought, you know, at least I needed a job. I needed to pay, you know, unemployment benefit then in central London was about 25 quid a week. Yeah. That went nowhere. Yeah. So it was a case of I need money, get a job, work, have something else to focus on other than HIV. Um, but also be aware that, you know, at the time it was still a, life-limiting kind of illness. So did you have to like live a disciplined lifestyle, like no alcohol, um, eat certain foods or anything like that? No, I mean, I, I went through my, what I call hippie phase of, of trying to live the healthy lifestyle. But, you know, to, to be fair, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life and still haven't, and I'm nearly 50. So smoking was never an issue. Alcohol, I drink very moderately. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of alcohol. Um, never done illegal drugs. So for me, there wasn't really anything to do other than try and eat healthily. Yeah. Now that worked to some degree, but I, you know, I didn't really have to adapt my life very much to kind of be healthy. Yeah. And how did you cross over from that work world into the world of public speaking? Well, through my original support group, Body Positive, which sadly no longer exists, they had a youth group at the time, Positive mm -hmm. Youth. Now, I was obviously... These are, these are like kids with, with HIV? Well, it, it was 16 to 25-year-olds, okay. that youth group. So I was only 22 when I was diagnosed. So I had, you know, reached... I was still in that kind of threshold. Um, and through that, they often would get schools approach the charity and say, have you got anyone willing to come in and talk? Yeah. Well, of course, most of the support group were young gay men mm -hmm. and we were still really in the sort of era of the Section 28 and promoting homosexuality in schools was not on. What Section 28? It was a government clause, a Conservative government, if memory serves me right, which basically banned the promotion of homosexuality in schools. OK. Um, it's obviously not in place anymore, but it, there was a lot of kind of fear around sort of allowing outwardly gay men into schools right um and so the support group i would be the one often asked can you go and talk to kids because a you know you're a woman b you don't fit the stereotype of what someone's expecting of a person with hiv yeah um so i do the odd one of those for um Let, let's go back to the first time that happened then did were you do you, do you remember which school it was your very first school i don't actually know do you remember if you were nervous uh, yeah, I would have been nervous, absolutely, because I had no... Well, A, I was still kind of getting used to it, because I think it was probably within six months of my diagnosis. Yeah. So it was all still very new to me. Um, and I had no idea whether I was going to get kind of spat on or kind of kids run out of the room or yeah. would the teachers shake my hand. You know, that's the sort of era we were in. And... I really don't remember how it went, but it must have gone well because I remember sort of thinking I can do that again. Yeah. Um, and in fact, what I had done before that was a couple of patient panels. Okay. My consultant at the time asked me to be on a patient panel where we were just educating doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. And I think it was from that where a couple of people came up afterwards and said, look, 
it was so great to have a woman's perspective that yeah. really changed my thoughts that I thought, you know, I've got to keep doing this because people are still thinking it's just a gaze, drug user's mm -hmm. disease. And if I can go, hello, it's happened to me, yeah. then we may kind of slowly chip away at that. I'll come back to schools in a minute, but just on that point you raised, did you have problems with people shaking hands? Yeah. Any any that you can remember? Yeah, um, I remember one teacher in a school when I went to the staff room afterwards, introduced to him, um, he shook my hand, no problem, and then said, oh, sorry, I wasn't in the talk. What was it about? And I said, well, I spoke about HIV. And he said, are you a medic then, doctor, nurse? And I said, no, I'm a patient. And you could just almost see the colour drain out of his face. And his first words were, oh, my God, and I've actually shaken your hand. And you kind of think, yeah, and? But in hindsight, for a joke, I should have gone amputate now. But I just... <laughs> Yeah, or I've been called evil. I remember one woman in school evil telling me I'm a school teacher. No, it was another guest speaker, but she basically said the only reason I'm in this position is because I chose to have sex before marriage, and that's oh. how God punishes people like oh, me. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so I'm, I'm evil. I've been being called promiscuous, promiscuous lifestyle. Yeah, and when I pointed out it was one individual I got infected from, that didn't hold any. Oh. Sort of, yeah. yeah, but. People, yeah, were afraid. So, so judgmental, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, so, all right. So you, you're just getting going into the schools now and you're getting a good reception. Yeah. And um, how are you measuring that is a, is a good reception? What's telling you this is this is resonating? Well, um, question, the either emails afterwards from pupils kind of going, wow, I've learned so much today or whatever. Yeah. And as time's built on, it's it's the repeat bookings. It's people booking me a year, two years in advance, yeah. because they know, you know, that I can do what they want me to do. <laughs> and is there a common theme to these emails, or are they all have got their own individual stories? Oh no, they're they're all individual. I mean, in the early years, it would be very rare for any pupil to acknowledge they've either had someone in their family living with HIV. Mm -hmm. But we, I'm getting that now. I have yeah. pupils come up and share. Teachers even come up and share. So I know things are moving slowly, but often in the early years, it was that fear around, oh, you know, can I catch it from kissing? You know, yeah. Those sorts of things. Um, today, it'll be a variety of things, mm -hmm. yeah. but they're still coming. And are there certain questions that they ask that come up over and over again? Well, the way I structure, structure my talk in schools is I don't tell my whole story. You don't tell your whole story? I don't story. tell the whole story. Say if I have an hour slot, yeah. I'll do a sort of 20-minute intro, which at the end of it, I've just disclosed I'm positive. Ah. So I build them up to that. Yeah. Don't tell the whole story because then if they've been listening, the questions bring out the rest of it. Oh. So often the questions will be, well, how did your family react? And what happened to Ian? That's interesting. And yeah, because there's no point me just telling the whole thing in an hour and giving five minutes for questions. Yeah. I'd much rather have that interaction and well, see. How much time is for, available for questions in your talks? Usually 40 minutes or so. Grief. Yeah. And that's how you tell the rest of your story. Yeah, yeah, questions. through the questions. You've always done that. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, because I'd, <laughs> I, I'd much rather the kids, because then you know they've been listening. If they, because you know, you yeah. can't hear my story or the bits I tell without then thinking, what happened? What she hasn't said what happened to Ian and she hasn't mentioned her family and yeah. you know and all the other things about you know other relationships you know when I disclosed that Ian died so yeah. you know it, it all all comes out and I've never had no questions never in all the imagine. years I've been doing I it so. so after Ian died were you single then for a while did you think that you would never be in a relationship again I've got this and it, nobody's going to want to be with me did you go through those kind of thought processes? Oh, very much so, because, you know, I I just thought this is... I was very clear that if I started a new relationship, the guy would have to know. Yeah. Not a chat-up line, because, hi, I'm Emma, I've got <laughs> HIV. Not, not going to work. Um, and how did that go down in the early days when you... Well, when to be brought... fair, I tried it once on a first date, and the yeah. guy went to the gents and never came back. Wow. So I figured this is not a first date conversation. Did you push it back to the second or third after that? Yeah, yeah. Because then you'd start, people would say, well, you know, have you had other relationships? Yes. Well, what happened? Well, he died. Oh, what did he die of? Oh, 
he had an illness was it cancer you know and you just end yeah. up kind of going no 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 he was like had hiv he died of aids related pneumonia and did you have to hold your breath and just and then people would go but you don't have it do you and then you go yes i do and then it's really twofold response it's either the let's get out of here run a mile never want to see you again right on the spot they do that not like oh yeah yeah they they you can physically see i had in the past seen people physically move away and you just kind yeah. of go really and then, then I thought, okay, I'll try dating in the support group. Because if we're both here because we know we've got HIV, right. that's going to be so much easier. Yeah. But in the early 90s, the vast majority of people in my support group were gay or bisexual men. Okay. So although I did have a nearly four-year relationship with one of them, he ultimately decided he wanted to be with a man. Right. So I thought, okay, this is not going to work for me. So yeah. I, obviously I'll try dating in the real world. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was hit and miss for many, many years. Yeah. You know, nothing long term, nothing serious. Um, and pretty much I had given up recently thinking, you know, it's just, you know, A, I'd survived to middle age. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard enough starting dating in your 40s, let alone when you're middle aged HIV positive. And I just pretty much thought that's it. It's, yeah. And then out of the blue, someone who'd been a friend for many, many years um, wrote me a letter telling me he loved me. What? <laughs> yeah. It was kind of freaked me out initially. In fact, he'd say I definitely freaked out because I just thought, y you can't love me. I've got HIV, all the baggage. And, yeah. you know, and I do remember him saying, well, you know, we've, we've all got baggage. So let's share the load. And Prior that to that moment. Yeah. Did you ever think this could end up in a romantic situation with this person or was it a friend no no he was just a good friend he okay. I mean, he was married at the time but yeah. sadly his wife died so okay. you know I, I just did not think it was you know anything more than that i mean yeah. obviously i was attracted to him because he was a nice guy and you know good and because you both had deceased partners you kind of understood understood what, what, what grief had, meant had been yeah. Through and with, yeah with the grief and um you know, and so we started dating and we were engaged within six weeks because, That's you know, we, we realised we will spend the rest of whatever life we have together. Yeah. And, you know, he's not HIV positive. And if someone had yeah. said to me 27 years ago, you'll end up engaged to an HIV negative man and you'll be able to have unprotected sex. <laughs> that would have been a crazy idea. Absolutely yeah. unbelievable. But that that's where we're at today. That's, and that's fantastic. You know, I feel very blessed that he's in my life. And uh, yeah, yeah he's, he's very special to me. Great, that's good to hear. Now, my average audience is young people. So to the young people out there who may be struggling with issues or thinking about um, their own sexual education, perhaps it's lacking in their school or wherever they are in the world, what kind of a message would you say to the people who are watching us today? In terms of protecting themselves? Yeah, or, in yeah. terms of what, what would your advice be to them? Well, A, make yourself aware of the reality of HIV today. If we're, if, if we're talking HIV, um, you know, condoms are still fantastic. Used correctly, not splitting, not coming off. HIV cannot get through a condom. Is it a myth that if you put two condoms on, it protects you more? No, that's a really dumb idea. Okay. Condom on top of condom, rubbing together, friction, that's not going to work. Right. It's definitely. De I was, I tried oh, that will that. cause it to split, the friction. Yeah, but it's more <gasps> likely to, yeah. Okay. I, th I did try that initially because I thought that's got to be extra safe. Yeah. And I remember a health advisor saying that was the dumbest thing I could be doing. So you're making it worse. Yeah. Increasing yeah. your risk. One condom is all you need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Obviously, learn how to use them correctly. Are there certain brands of condoms that have a better reputation for holding up? I, not that I'm aware of, but obviously condoms have, um, well, certainly in the UK, have the British safety mark on them. I want to see that on so it. So make sure you, you've got that. Make yeah. sure you're not using a packet that's out of date. Okay. Who knew that condoms had a use-by date? What happens, I didn't. If, what happens if they're out of date? Well, then the, the rubber may perish much easier. Okay. Um, it's, you know, they might that's more likely to split or whatever. Yeah. Um, so learn learn the basics about how to use a condom correctly. Yeah. That's one option. Also, be aware today that, as I said earlier, if a person with HIV is taking treatment, they are no longer a risk to you if they're undetectable on their treatment. So okay. undetectable, untransmittable. So yeah. that lessens the risk if you happen to find yourself with a partner who's HIV positive. Yeah. Because the target is to get you know, 90% of all cases 
on treatment. Mm -hmm. I think the UK is getting close to that now. Um, but obviously we have a situation both in this country and around the world where many people are undiagnosed. Right. They have HIV, they've been infected at another point in their life and have no idea. Yeah. I know in my case, had Ian said nothing when that condom broke, it took 12 years till I got sick. Right. So I always say to, would say to someone, look at your life. Have you in the last five, 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. 20 years even had unprotected sex. Mm -hmm. If so, get yourself a sexual health checkup. Yeah. Make sure you've got nothing that has gone undiagnosed for mm -hmm. a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously you're then making choices with info information. You know if you have or haven't got an STI. Yeah. Um, as I say, condoms used correctly. We are now in a position where we have drugs that can prevent HIV, okay. PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Unfortunately, in England, PrEP is only currently available on a trial basis. Mm. It's not freely available on the NHS yet. Yeah. I hope in time that will be the case because PrEP works. We know PrEP works. Um, but at the moment in England, on a trial, go to Scotland or Wales, you can get it through the NHS yeah. or buy it privately. And it's a drug you, you take to prevent HIV transmission. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding as well around HIV positive and AIDS. So for people who are watching this who don't understand the difference, could you just clarify that? Yeah, HIV is the human immunodeficiency virus. Mm -hmm. Not as someone once asked me or told me they thought it was highly infected vagina. <laughs> oh God. So human immunodeficiency virus and HIV is present in bodily fluids. The only ones capable of transmitting the virus are blood, semen from men, vaginal fluids from women, breast milk from pregnant women. Breast milk even. Yeah, again, but that can be eliminated if the mother's taking antiretroviral drugs. Okay. Um, but undiagnosed or untreated HIV positive women may pass the virus to their babies through breastfeeding. Okay. Um, any other bodily fluids like saliva cannot transmit HIV. Mm -hmm. I remember so many th people thinking in the 80s, 90s, you could catch HIV from kissing. Yeah. No, you cannot. Never have done, never will do. These lips kiss Bruce Springsteen. I wouldn't have done that if there was a, any risk whatsoever. So kissing safe. Oh, just as an aside, that was live on stage at Madison Square Garden in New York. How many times have you been to see Bruce? Uh, 69 now. Didn't you set a goal of... At your TED talk, did you say something about? Oh, I'm not. I'm not allowed to, to die until Bruce stops touring. You know? <laughs> yeah, basically. Oh, and if you're listening, Bruce, comical. I'd love to come to Broadway, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, once infected, the virus targets certain cells called the CD4 cells, mm -hmm. and they're all part of our immune systems. Um, Left untreated, a person with HIV will see that CD4 count decline. Okay. So if I took a sample of blood from you, you're a healthy young guy, yeah. sent it to a lab, you'd expect your CD4 count to be 500 or well over 1,000 mm -hmm. or higher. A person with HIV, over time, CD4 count declines, drop below 200, mm -hmm. then you're vulnerable to a whole range of other illnesses. That's when they enter. Fungal, viral, bacterial infections, even some forms of cancer may develop. Right. And it's those opportunistic infections like PCP pneumonia, which is what Ian died from, yeah. that get the label AIDS. Okay. So AIDS itself doesn't exist. There's not an illness called AIDS that you can catch or develop or die from. It's just the label given to all these other illnesses you may develop. I if see. you're fortunate enough to have access to antiretrovirals, you're unlikely to develop the traditional AIDS-related illness today. Okay. If you were to get pregnant then, yeah. what's the risk for your baby? Uh, zero today. Really? You, uh, an HIV-positive woman can have a child at no risk of transmission, Agreed. providing she stays on antiretrovirals through the pregnancy, Yeah. doesn't breastfeed after the baby's born. Yeah. Um, at birth, the baby may still test positive because mm -hmm. it inherits the maternal antibodies from the birth process. Yeah. Within 12 months, 18 months at maximum, the baby will not have the mother's antibodies and will not be infected themselves. I see. So actually, say here in the UK, mother to child transmission is as low as 0.1% risk. Mm -hmm. Very. It's, it's about 10, maybe 20 babies a year in this country right. are born and stay positive after 18 months. Very low risk. And over the years, has the sexually transmitted disease landscape changed such that there are other things that are more threatening to young people now that are more that they could more likely catch that perhaps are not as 
um, life-threatening as what you went through. Well, yes. I mean, HIV was always the sort of least likely to be caught by most young people. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, chlamydia rates, gonorrhea, syphilis, mm. they're all haven't really declined over the years, maybe small drops. Um, but now we're seeing sort of rises again in certain STIs, particularly amongst gay and bisexual young men. So what is chlamydia? So <laughs> It's an STI. I'm not very good on other STIs. HIV okay. is my back. <laughs> right, okay. Um, you got no gory details. No, I... I <laughs> have to refer you to other places for other STIs. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard my mates just um, saying syphilis, syphilis, it hurts when I piss. That's all about. I know about oh, STIs, right. really. Yeah. Um, well, to be fair, I've, I've never had any other STI, so yeah. I have no experience of anything other than HIV. Okay. So um, yeah. I'd, I'd have to refer you to other sources. Of, <laughs> I'm sure there are very good websites that give you sexual health information. <laughs> And you booked to do an over 100 talks again this year? Yes. Um, well, we're in the autumn term now, and I'll have done 52 this term. I've already got, I think, 40 booked for the spring, and the summer's looking like it could get busy as well. Do you know what your record number of talks in a year is? I think the most I did was 128 wow. in one academic year. Where was the furthest away from this country you've done a talk? I, oh, I did get flown over to Frankfurt last year to speak right. at an inter international school. Yeah. So I've done Frankfurt. Here in the UK, the furthest I go is Gordonston, up in the highlands of Scotland. Okay. Do you have to uh, fly up there? I do fly or catch the train, the all nine-hour train journey to oh. Elgin. Um, I have got an inquiry to do a school in Madrid next year, so I hope that comes off. That would be good to go do. Yeah. Um, and doing talks at that rate, don't you feel burnt out? I don't. And I've always told myself if I ever walk away from a talk saying that didn't go well or I don't think I delivered, that's when I stop. Yeah. Because for me, although I know the story and I've heard it hundreds of times, thousands yeah. of times even now, the kids in front of me, it's their one and only time to hear it. Yeah. So for me, it has to say always feel fresh. And the way I do that is by not kind of speaking for an hour, like at rote. Mm. I, I have the basics that I want covered, yeah. but it's a 20 minute intro. And then I invite the students to ask questions. So it always to bring changes out, the dynamic. To bring out yeah. the um, other bits of the story. Yeah. And, you know, all the years I've been speaking publicly, I've never had no questions. Because um, the teachers say to me sometimes, Sean, you've been coming doing this talk now for years here. Uh, you're getting sick of it. And I, I say that, you know, I come in, I never know what the questions are going to be like. Every year group has its own chemistry. Yeah. And it, if I came in and they were playing on the phones and there was no questions, I'd stop tomorrow. Yeah. But it's, it's, you feel that connection with them, don't you? Well, I, I just, I haven't got it to hand, but like just last week I had an email from a pupil going, you engage me more in that hour than I've had, that, than the teachers have in the last five wow. years. Yeah. And you think, well... I'm going to carry on then because yes. for that one lad, you know, he's seeing life differently because of what he heard me say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he did make me laugh because he's saying it's their job and they can't do it. And yeah. you've come in and done it. So, so you're yeah. transmitting that energy to the kids. What are you taking away from it psychologically doing this public speaking? Well, it's funny, in the early years, I thought the more I talk about it, it might go away. <laughs> so uh, that was my kind of thinking at first. Yeah. And then I suppose as the years have gone on, you know, it's A, knowing it makes a difference. You know, I've been stopped in the most bizarre places. I was stopped at London Zoo, in London Zoo. Yeah. Did you come to my school? Uh, I may have done. <laughs> yes, I did. You know, stopped outside Queen's Park Rangers, my football team. I was yeah. leaving a home game. Some bloke stopped me and said, I think you spoke at my school. I said, oh, where do you teach? He went, no, it was when I was a pupil. <laughs> it's like 10 years before. Yeah. He still recognised me and remembered me. Yeah. You know, I meet teachers now who heard me when they were pupils. The talk yeah. still... Wow. They still remember. Do you ever have parents requesting to meet you or, or communicate with you? I have had emails from parents, yeah. And what do they say? Thank you. Yeah. Their kids have gone home and told them about my talk. Yeah. And then they've 
got in touch with me going, you've made such a difference to my young you know, son or young daughter. Yeah. Or I've heard from teachers where a parent has written to the school thanking them for inviting me in. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if I get any response from a parent, that really touches me because I know yeah. how tough it was as a teenager to go home and tell your parents anything that happened in school. So the fact that someone can do that and then that generates a response to me from the parent is like fantastic. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. It's, they're not very often, but when one of them comes through, it really uh, warms my heart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, And that's why we keep doing it. Because, you know, if you can make a difference just to one person in the room, you don't know where that's going to ripple out to. Yeah. And, you know, everyone's sort of learning yeah. all the time. So. So where are you going to go next? Are you, do you, are you just going to keep going with what you're doing or do you have any uh, other plans to do other things? Well, I turn 50 next year. So I really, part of me thinks, am I too old to still be going in talking to teenagers about sex and <laughs> STIs? But, you know, I have bookings a year in advance. So yeah. even if I wanted to take a break, the schools wouldn't let me. Yeah. So <laughs> while I've always said, well, I'm still here, I, I will continue to do it because what I want today's young people to see mm -hmm. and what, what I can give because I'm a long-term survivor, you know, there are, there are many younger people who've been diagnosed in the last five, 10 years making mm. careers out of HIV now. Mm. They will never know what the real experience was like because yeah. they're living at a time where people are not dying every week. Right. You know, they won't have to s bury friends week after week. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all well and good there other people taking up the mantle, mm -hmm. but I don't want people to think that HIV is just a recent thing. Yeah. You know, that the, I went to a play on um Friday night written about the time when Princess Diana shook hands with the AIDS patient. Mm -hmm. It's called A Moment of Grace, and it captured that uh, those early years and what i don't want today's young people to s realize is that hiv is you know just a couple of pills yeah it's not many thousands died you know and the long-term survivors went through that cumulative grief they've mm -hmm. had they, they wear the scars you yeah. know even after all these years you can have a conversation with someone from that early time and you know you'll be in tears within five minutes yeah. because that hurt is still there mm -hmm. So I can go in and say, that's how HIV was. This is how it is today. But thank, you know, thanks to the, all those people who died, we've made progress. Yeah. You know, people were in drug trials in those early years, you know. And, and pe yeah, I say so many died that I don't want them to be forgotten. And part of the reason I will continue is because I don't want people thinking it's just a recent sort of, you know, oh, it's no big deal anymore. You take your tablets, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, you are, but... That's because of the history. Mm -hmm. Would you do, do talks to adults? Do you think at some point? Yeah, I still, I do. You I, do I talk still, to I still do my patient panel. Um, oh, you still do that? Well, up until this year, I have. So I did that for well over twenty years. In the early years, mm -hmm. I was doing, you know, training courses for midwives, nurses, the police. I did a lot in the early years. Obviously, yeah. over time, again, because HIV has changed in recent years, there perhaps isn't that fear as that needs to be addressed through mm -hmm. training as much. But um, yeah, I mean, give me an audience. Obviously the TEDx talk was, you know, my first sort of experience of talking to adults for a very long time. Yeah, and I'm gonna put the link to the TEDx talk in the description box below this video. So I encourage you to go over and watch Emma doing the TEDx talk in Guildford, which is, was just around the corner from where I live actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what do you think about certain movies that have portrayed people with AIDS? Was it um, Dallas Buyers Club? Dallas Buyers Club was the most recent one I remember. That, again, that was very well done. I mean, yeah. I watched that with a fellow long-term survivor friend of mine, and we both came out going, that really captured those early years. Yeah, I thought um, it was a brilliant movie. Whereas Philadelphia was very much Hollywood does AIDS. I right. mean, it, it, it still gets brownie points because it had a Bruce Springsteen track on the, you know, <laughs> in the soundtrack. But yeah. um, it was very much, you know, the the white heterosexual woman who got infected from a blood transfusion was the victim mm -hmm. and gay man sort of got what he deserves sort of attitude. So Philadelphia, you know, it was good for its time, but it really was quite dated now. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one that still I remember, which I don't think was got a very wide sort of broadcast was something called um silver lake life mm, which was a document no it was a documentary about two gay men in america and it was just literally watching one of them dying <sighs> from aids and it was you know people i i you know 
I didn't, but I often wish I'd taken a photo of Ian in those last few days yeah. to say this is is what AIDS looked like. You know, it was the classic. If you remember that, you probably don't remember, but the Benetton ad where they had a pe dying man of AIDS, a man dying of AIDS. Don't recall that one. Yeah, no. ben Benetton sort of why they thought that was a good image, I don't know. But that for me was sort of like, that's how AIDS was in yeah. those days. No, that's not to say people are not still dying of AIDS. They are. Yeah. But, you know, there are also many thousands living now mm -hmm. with HIV, not dying. So. If people want to find you online, what are your socials? Uh, on Twitter, um, Emma Cole HIV and I have a, my uh, website link from the Twitter account as well. So if a positive if, voice. If any kids like want to pass links on to the teachers to book you, where should they go to find your school's talks information? Uh, on my website. So that's positivevoice-emacole.co.uk. Okay. I think. <laughs> <laughs> We can find it and put it in the link yeah, underneath. Yeah, I'll definitely have all these links in the description box. And I've seen Emma talk. I'm telling you, if you can get her in your school, if you're lucky enough to get her in your school, you're in, you're in for a tree. And it's going to be, there's some really valuable lessons in there as well for the students. So is there anything else you would like to say to people watching this on YouTube? Well, thanks very much for listening. And I hope you learned something from what we've had to chat about today. Cool. Yeah. Hope you've enjoyed this. Please put your comments below. Let's give Emma a hug before we finish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>